Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Best Movie, Worst Movie uh, here on the channel. I am your host, uh, John Campia. Good to have you guys here. And of course, joined in person here by Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. How are you doing today, Robert? Oh, it's great to be here. I, you know, I love doing these shows, John. They're so much fun. I, I really like these and we've got a great topic today. And joining us, of course, uh, Cody Miller is joining us here today. Cody, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. I always look forward to talking movies with you guys, so this is fun. Thanks. Uh, and we've got a really good one today. It's a good one. We've got a really good topic today, because today we are going to discuss the best movies and the worst movies of the filmography of one Quentin Tarantino. So in case the title doesn't give it away, guys, here's what we're going to do. We are first going to talk about what we feel each one of us is the best of the Quentin Tarantino films. And then once we go through that, we will then discuss what we think are, unfortunately, the worst film of Quentin Tarantino's filmography. And uh, that's why we call this show Best Movie, Worst Movie. Rob, Quentin Tarantino. I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that he is indeed one of at least the top three, four, or five most celebrated filmmakers of the last like 20 years. Oh, easily. What is it about Quentin Tarantino that like makes his film resonate with especially cinephiles? I just love his film so much. You know what I think it is? And I was thinking a lot about this knowing we were gonna do this show. It's his characters. I mean, you, 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 they talk about there's hangout movies, you know, like something like Dazed and Confused is kind of a hangout movie. You hang out with the characters. The thing about Quentin Tarantino's films, though, is all of his characters, I just want to hang out with them. Right. Like, I, you know, their, their character interaction, they're just talking. I mean, he can make a conversation about a Royale with cheese. You know, you wish you were in that car with, with Travolta and, and Sam Jackson. And, and, I felt this way, John, when I, I I did not see Reservoir Dogs in the theater, much to my chagrin. I bought the Laserdisc, and <laughs> the laser I, disc. I had the Laserdisc, and I, you know, it's a widescreen movie. I sat down, I watched it. I was absolutely knocked out by Reservoir Dogs. Now, I had not seen Ringo Lamb's City on Fire, which people talk a lot about. That was his inspiration. But, you know, just from that opening, when they're all talking, the camera swirling around them. Let me tell you what Like a Virgin's about. You know, like a virgin is about a guy who wants or a girl who wants a guy with a big D, you know, and, and you're like, what? What is this movie about? And yet it goes in. You've got Steve Buscemi. Look at the, the, the cast of characters. I mean, every, everyone from Lawrence Tierney to Tim Roth. I mean, oh, I forgot Chris Penn. Oh, and Chris Penn. Penn and I, I mean, it is. I, and I sat there and I watched it back to back. I watched it twice and I was so knocked out by it. And that was his first feature. Uh, that was released anyway. And that that film just, it, it was such a, it, it was somebody planting a flag going, this is a brand new voice that we've never heard before that was already a powerhouse of, of filmmaking. And it was his first indie film. And I'm like, man, this was awesome. Uh, for you characters, um, for me, dialogue. I, I think dialogue was is the thing for me that when I'm, when I've got a Quentin Tarantino film on, on low, instantly it's a Quentin Tarantino film. It's this impeccable, incredible sense of this frantic and kinetic pace he always has to his dialogue. And going back to Reservoir Dogs, right? You just look at that scene with Steve Buscemi just talking about tipping. Like the Quentin Tarantino, almost all of his movies will have in there several, mo several instances and several scenes where there is an apparent mundane conversation but done in the Quentin Tarantino style, that all of, that's a little bit more heightened than our regular conversations. But we totally recognize we have had these conversations. So whether it's that you you were talking about Pulp Fiction with that scene in the car, just talking about the El Royale with cheese. I mean, these are all mundane conversations that Tarantino finds a way to pepper into his movies, but they become integral scenes and that these, these things that become so memorable. And it's not just the, the mundane ones. Like he just has a sense of you know what I actually compare it to a little bit? There's a little bit of Kevin Smith in, in his writing. Kevin Smith and Tarantino have that same kind of flair with their dialogue, but Tarantino's a little bit more focused. And it, I could just listen to his stories. Now, obviously, he still creates great stories around the dialogue. Right. Absolutely. But honestly, even without the stories, I could sit down and just listen to no, and, that and, he has with his dialogue. And that, that's kind of what I meant, that his characters are defined through what they're talking about. Yeah. And, you know, even though the dialogue might be mundane, you're learning about things. Like, you're learning, like, oh, Travolta's character went to Europe. 
you know, and he, he was hanging out and, and yet he's telling us about what this guy's worldview is by what he chose to focus on. Uh, they don't know. We got the metric system. Man. <laughs> they don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just uh, so much fun to watch his movies. So Cody, let's go over to you. I mean, for, for Rob, it's characters for me, it's dialogue. What is it about Quentin Tarantino's films for you that just make them attractive? Well, I completely agree on the characters. Just that scene alone in Reservoir Dogs when they're all sitting around the table just talking crap. I mean, who wouldn't want to just be a fly on the wall and actually be listening to those kind yeah. of Yeah. But I to add to that, he does music selection so, oh, yeah. so well. And to continue talking about Reservoir Dogs, I mean, that scene when the Steelers wheel song stuck in the middle with you comes on. Every time I hear that now, I am I'm immediately transported to that scene where he's about yep. to torture that guy. I mean, it's just there's so many instances in his movies where a song comes on. And now that song is imprinted with that scene. And he does it so well. But the biggest thing, like you said, is characters. All of his characters feel real. Even a movie like The Hateful Eight, which is maybe one of his weaker films, those characters feel real and they're characters that i would want to sit at a bar with and just listen to them talk <laughs> about stealing horses or lighting or lighting things on fire so he's one of the unique directors where when you turn on a quentin tarantino film you know you're watching a quentin tarantino film you can just feel it in every aspect of the film and that's probably the highest compliment you could give to a director it's such a distinct style and flair and he's going to go down in history as Obviously, he's already one of the greats, but he will be discussed on the, the Mount Rushmore of directors forever. People will be discussing, you know, maybe he's in the top five just because of all those things that he does so perfectly. So I can't wait to talk about the best and the worst of Quentin. You well, know, that's a good segue right there. So <laughs> let's dive into the best and the worst. And Rob, I want to start with you now. You go down the nine film filmography, uh, filmography of Quentin Tarantino. There's obviously a lot of bangers on there, but for you, when talking about Tarantino, what's the definitive Tarantino film for you? Well, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how Tarantino borrows a lot from other filmmakers, but I would say he doesn't necessarily borrow them. He takes inspiration from them and then he puts his own spin his own, yeah. on everything. And, you know, John, I'm always banging on about tone and how difficult it is to retain tone, especially within scenes. And then the overall movie has to work. Well, I think my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie, there's a lot. I had a hard time. I, I juggled, I, I, was, I was wrestling with this. I have to say it's gotta be Inglorious Bastards. Nice. For me. Now, only because if you watch that film, it has like the opening scene where where the the where, where you see Christoph Waltz come into the home, La, the La Petite the farm yeah. how farmhouse the tension in that scene it is it is it, it's both in, in a way it's it's deliciously entertaining to watch but the tension that he pulls out and it's these two guys talking and you realize you don't really know what's happening and then at the just when you think it's gone on too long the camera tilts down and you realize that this farmer has been hiding these Jews that Christoph Waltz is looking for. They're right underneath the floorboards of where they're sitting. And, you know, you're, you're watching this and it's, it's the tension's unbelievable. But then as you move through the movie, you get these, these scenes where they're totally different kinds of scenes. They're funny. Brad Pitt's his whole, his whole team, the inglorious bastards themselves are funny. I mean, the, but the tone is is different than you've ever seen. And then they go into the basement of the bar and there's another long extended scene that, I mean, with Diane Kruger and Michael Fassbender. And the, again, it's an entertaining scene, but the tension is drawn out. And then there's this explosion of orgiastic violence. And, and then the whole, and then it turns into a total fantasy with killing Hitler, you know? And, and the fact that he can make it all work within the confines of the same movie, you're getting, it's almost like you've sat down to a nine course meal and you're getting all of these different flavors and all of these different tastes. But like any great meal, it all feels that it, it works together as one banquet. And that's, this movie, I think more than any of his movies might be the most original of Tarantino's films. And yet it's also one of the most wildly entertaining of his filmography, I think. You know, it's so funny that you mentioned Inglorious Bastards because I 
I don't know that there's ever been a movie in my life that I watched for the first time and just hated it and then later loved it. But I remember when I went to go see Inglourious Bastards in the theaters, I hated it. Like <laughs> capital H hated the movie. Like I thought it was just an, a, just a spit in the face to movie making itself. I thought it was that bad. <laughs> And then, so I didn't watch it again. Then like a year and a half later, I think I was on like on a date or something and the, the girl wanted to watch Inglorious Bastards. So I'm like, all right, like the girl wants to watch it. That's what we watch. And I watched it again. And I'm watching like, why didn't I like this? Yeah. And I just, I just like start asking myself these questions. Like, was I in a bad mood that day? Was there something going on? Because for a while, it became my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. Now, it didn't hold that spot. Mm. But but that but Inglorious Bastards was that movie, and actually for me it would probably come in number two on my list, only to my number one. And I, I don't think for anybody who knows me is going to be surprised by this, but for me the best Quentin Tarantino Tino movie is Django Unchained. Um, there, first of all, like Cody was describing before, it is a definitive Quentin Tarantino movie. I mean, there's no mistaking that this is absolutely Quentin Tarantino. Movie. Again, everything from the dialogue and the character, like right from the moment when Christoph Waltz rides up on those guys in his, in his horse and buggy with the tooth on top going back, hello, my good son. And it goes into his verbiage. Dr. And Schultz. It, it, Dr. Schultz and his dialogue and, and, and like his vocabulary and all that kind of stuff. And the, the, the pacing of which he speaks like Christoph Waltz won an well, he won an Academy the Academy Award for both of these. Films. Yes, he won Best Supporting Actor in Inglorious Bastards, and he won Best Supporting Actor in this. And there's there's something that he shows in this that there were flashes of in Inglorious Bastards as well. Tarantino has this ability to tell a story about some very very heavy themes, and yet make it wildly entertaining without ever once making levity of the heaviness of the themes he's addressing, right? right? So like, in there are several instances of that in Glorious Bastards. Once you get into Django Unchained, like he's dealing with like slavery and how they were treated and all that, this kind of stuff. And never once do you lose the horror of that, even while Samuel L. Jackson starts spouting off the, some of the most hilarious dialogue and the craziest stuff is happening. And, and he somehow manages to find that balance of taking something incredibly heavy and delivering it in a way, you know, it reminds me a little bit of like of a Taika Waititi a bit, like when you watch Jojo Rabbit and stuff like that, like that was there. And so you blend those great characters with fantastic dialogue and, and the music in Django is incredible as well. And then you add on top of that, the ability to make something wildly entertaining while heavy. And, and I'll tell you what though, near the end of that film, when Christoph Waltz, he is so traumatized. Schultz is so traumatized by what he has seen on this adventure and what he has seen Monsieur Candy do to his slaves and stuff. He is so traumatized by it that I, I think there's two things that, at, that are at play here in that ultimate climax scene when he kills Leonardo DiCaprio's character. In that, I think, number one, he was so, a lot of people interpret it, and I get this, that he was so disgusted by what Candy was that he was willing to kill him even if it cost him his own life. Right. I think there's a second side to that coin. I don't think he could face living anymore having seen what he saw. Uh, I, I honestly think, and, and so you've got this Tarantino filmmaker who can do all this stuff, and on top of that, create these existential questions going on. Like like now that Schultz, who had such a, a carefree view of life and everything, even as a bounty hunter, now he's seen some things he doesn't think he can live with. Right. And and it's just, that is what Tarantino can do. It's incredible, it's, it's fun, it's funny, it's horrifying, it stays with you, it's littered with Quentin Tarantino's always memorable scenes and infinitely quotable lines, uh, with some fantastic performances by Leonardo DiCaprio, um, uh, Christoph Waltz won the Academy Award, obviously. Um, I, I mean, just everybody in it was was great. There's one thing I want to add to this: his casting is always on the the, the 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 casting. I mean, I know he does work with a casting director, but you know when he writes these parts. These actors are like he famously revived John Travolta's career in Pulp yep. Fiction. You know, he brought back like Michael, Michael, uh, Mazden. Uh, well, Michael Mazin, but Michael uh, or no, um, 
uh, Robert Forrester. Right. He brought back Robert Forrester. And and he he just the way he pairs an actor with the part they play is unparalleled. And and that's another thing that these actors, because they're given the dialogue he gives them to play, they just they br- it, it brings out their best work, and you can't take your eyes off these people. And look look at Jamie Foxx, and, and, and who would have thought Leonardo DiCaprio would say some of the dialogue Tarantino put in his mouth? Oh, and so well. Oh, my God. And you know, speaking of Jamie Foxx and, and casting, you, of course, know that Jamie Foxx was not the one originally cast nope. to play Django. It was, was Will Smith. It was Will Smith who, who ultimately turned it down because he didn't think that Schultz should be the one to kill Candy at the end. And yeah. that's why he turned it down. And uh, I, I bet that's one of the ones he always regretted turning down. Oh. That and Matrix. Uh, yeah, was, yeah. yeah. And, and, but down. Jamie Foxx, you know, I don't know if Will Smith would have. Will Smith is a tremendous actor. A fa- fabulous actor. But I think in the role, like, I, I love Jamie Foxx. He, he works I, so I, I well. I love his face. Like, I loved him in Collateral. And I think that he's just his face is perfect. Like when he's sitting next to Franco Nero at the bar, the original yep. Django yep. and says the D is silent. You know, he just looks that no one could look cooler than Jamie Foxx in that moment. I don't think Will Smith could have done it as good as him. All right. So we've got for Tarantino's best. We've got Inglorious Bastards. We've got Django Unchained. So let's go over to Cody. Cody, there's I mean, it, it's funny because you're talking about Tarantino. It's not that big of a list. No, but so many good movies on that short list. And so what to you is the best of Quentin Tarantino? Yeah, he doesn't have a bad film or a movie that I would consider to be bad. They're all right. at least really good, like really good. And so when we get to the worst one, it's a tricky one. But the best one, I almost went with Reservoir Dogs simply because the majority of that film is just guys sitting in rooms or standing in place talking like it's just dialogue. But the reason I went with another film is because he took though that skill set and then builds off of it and starts to rewrite history in a way that you buy. And gentlemen, I'll just say, we're going to be doing one thing and one thing only, and that's killing Nazis. <laughs> and that film, Inglorious Bastards, is my favorite. And the last line of that film, you know, Brad Pitt turns to the camera and he's looking at it and he's carving a swastika into Christoph yep. Waltz's With BJ forehead. Novak standing there beside and, him. Yeah, and he says... I think this just might be my masterpiece. It's almost <laughs> like Quentin knew. Like he was winking at the audience like this is my best work. And I believe it is his best work. Um, there's so many things to love about this film, particularly the way that he deals with tone. From the tension of the Jews hiding under the floorboards in the beginning of the film, as Rob talked about, to the ridiculous jokes that are made when they're standing in a ballroom all dressed up, not speaking the native tongue, and they're just looking at each other awkwardly. Like, you know, he has a way of interjecting humor into scenes that on paper, to me, like, it doesn't work. Like, it would pull you out of the film. And a lot of films try those types of things, but with with Quentin's movies, it's, it's like it almost works. He does things, for example, his movies for the most part, are really grounded in reality. Yes, there's like ridiculous bombastic action to the point where it blows your mind, but he sets the stage in the first two acts of his films, particularly in Inglorious Bastards, where you feel like this is could essentially be a period piece with these kind of wacky zany characters that you buy as being real. Like these actors inhabit these roles in ways that other directors just can't get that out of them. Part of it is the dialogue, part of it is him just being a killer director. Like Brad Pitt's character, Lieutenant Aldo Rain, is my favorite Brad Pitt performance because <laughs> I bought him. He made me laugh. I felt like he had heart when there were times to be at heart when there he's like, no one wants to fight in a basement. Like he just says things that just that get you and cut right. Grazzi. To you, right? That's my favorite <laughs> line of his in the movie. Oh, Grazzi. Man. It's so good. And just at the end of the day, when they start to rewrite history at the end of this film. I bought it. Like, I know that that's not what happens in real life. But as it's happening, you're just like, yep. And you're just fully bought in. And like I said, if you were to see, you know, a three page outline of some of these stories, particularly in Glorious Bastards, you'd be like, you just there's just no way you're going to be able to do this in a way where you're, you're, you're buying this as as a form of reality. 
And and you do when you watch Inglorious Bastards. And I think that's why it resonated so well. And I think that's why that last line of the film is this just might be my masterpiece because it's so it's endlessly rewatchable. I mean, just the long, drawn out scenes, the way he's able to hold your attention, that's master filmmaking at its best. In addition to rewriting history and creating all these amazing characters, it is Inglorious Bastards is, I believe, his masterpiece. So we've got two for Inglorious Bastards, one for Django Unchained, and uh, you guys at home, probably a, a wider list than that. So those are our picks for the best of Quentin Tarantino. All right. Now we're going to move into the worst. Now, before we get into the worst one, so we want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode of Best Movie, Worst Movie, our friends over at Raycon. We want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's video, Raycon. Now, guys, you've heard me talk about the fact that part of my morning routine is getting on my treadmill. And when I do, I always have my Raycon earbuds there to listen to my podcasts and YouTube videos. I go to them every morning. Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. With optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit, these earbuds are so comfortable and they will not budge. Trust me. Raycon gives you eight hours of playtime and 32-hour battery life. And the best part for me is that Raycons are priced just right. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. That's half the price. And with premium features like noise isolation, awareness mode, and I personally love the earbud tap functions, it's perfect for when I'm on the treadmill. So guys, go to buyraycon.com slash campia today and get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash campia to get 15% off. Buyraycon.com slash campia. for sponsoring this episode of Best Movie, Worst Movie. All right, guys, with that down, let's now move into our worst. And, you know, uh, Cody brought up something about earlier and saying in the Quentin Tarantino filmography, there's really not a bad film. And I would agree with that with one exception. Now, there are, there are two films that I would put down at the bottom, right? One I would classify as my least favorite. Least favorite. That one would be uh, Hateful Eight. Hateful Eight was a movie that had some drama going on around because, you know, Tarantino's planning to do it for a while. Then I think the script got leaked. Yeah. He says, that's it. I'm not going to make this film anymore. Then he changed his mind, came back, made the film. And, and it's not a bad movie. Not a bad movie, but, you know, in the big list of my favorite Quentin Tarantino movies, I would say that one would be my least favorite. But there is one movie that I do think is a bad movie. Uh, that is, like, I watched it and went, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be quite happy to never watch this again. And that movie was one half of a larger movie, of a grindhouse movie. Um, that he did with Robert Rodriguez. Of course, Robert Rodriguez, half of that was called... Uh, Planet, Planet Terror. Planet Terror, which was actually not bad. I didn't mind Planet Terror. But Death Proof was awful. Death on, Proof man. is the one Quentin Tarantino movie, the only Quentin Tarantino movie that I straight up think is a bad movie. And, and it's, it's unfortunate because, like, within this bad movie... There's one of the greatest car action scenes in the history of cinema. Like the car action scene in Death Proof is absolutely fantastic. And, and it's it's riveting when it's on and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, it's I almost felt like it was so bad that the Quentin Tarantino Hallmark Incredible Dialogue, I, I almost felt like, and I'm sure this isn't true, but I almost felt like I'm watching it's like, I feels like Tarantino knows this movie is bad. So he's putting his dialogue into overdrive to really try to compensate for it. Um, it was just, I had absolutely no interest in any of the characters. No, I never once at all felt like, ooh, I care about what happens. Like in all the Tarantino films, Rob, you're pointing out characters. Like, and Stuntman Mike is, I mean, it's a, first of all, it's a cool name and everything, but I never gave a shit about that character. And I certainly didn't give a, I didn't care about any of the girl care, even the amazing Rosario Dawson, didn't care. Simply did not care. It's like, okay, you're getting a lap dance scene. Woohoo. Like it, it just, it was, it was a bunch of random selections of ideas that seemingly were thrown together. And it was all built around this notion of this incredible car chase scene. So while it is not one of the worst films ever, 
it is the one film on Quentin Tarantino's list for me that is like, that movie is just not good and I don't ever want to watch it again. So for me, it's going to be death proof. Cody, let's go over to you. Now, like, like I said with Hateful Eight, to me, that was just my least favorite. Now, I know you don't believe there's a single bad one on Tarantino's list, but if you had to pick the one that is the least of them, which one is that for you? Dude, both those movies are awesome. I don't know what you, maybe you had a bad day when you went and saw those because both of them are awesome. I totally disagree. Um, Hateful Eight's like middle of the pack, but I enjoy those characters and those scenes of dialogue so much. Um, this one was a tough one, but I ultimately came back to what Quentin film would I want to rewatch last? And I thought about it and unfortunately I had to go with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm, wow. Now, this is a movie that I actually... Similar to what you said, John, with Inglorious Bastards, when I walked out of the theater, I was like, I, I did not like that. Like, I did not enjoy that. And then I rewatched it again when it hit streaming, and I enjoyed it more. I actually, there were a lot more good things in that movie than I gave it credit for initially. Um, so this is a movie that I enjoy, but I don't love, like, pretty much all of his other films. The things that I enjoy, though, are really great. I mean, the way that they completely reconstructed old school Hollywood is amazing. Those yeah. scenes where they're just driving around are fantastic. I mean, it's and I love old Hollywood history. So I was maybe my expectations were too high going into the film because I love Hollywood history. I love a good period piece. But so much of this movie is just unnecessary fluff. And, you know, the Margot Robbie character, the Sharon Tate, her name's Sharon yeah. Tate, correct? Yep. Okay. Yep. So watching this film, Sharon Tate is in the movie because they're setting up for the change of history that Quentin has become notorious for. But the reality is, as you said earlier when we talked earlier, John, her character was kind of pointless because she just didn't do anything. And there's like 30 minutes of screen time that you could have cut right out of the film. And I think that they were just trying to set the stage for the big swap, you know, knowing the history that Sharon Tate is brutally murdered. Um, but ultimately, it's just... I don't ever need to watch that 30 minutes ever again. And um, yeah, it, it just felt it just felt a little hollow. Now, the, the dialogue is still really good. Brad Pitt is great. Obviously, Leonardo DiCaprio, he he's great. But, you know, I felt the six month time gap in the middle. It just felt a little disconjointed. Um, it just didn't flow as a film the way that his other films flow. Like Inglorious Bastards and Django Unchained are both two hours and 30 minutes with maybe some change. And once upon a time in Hollywood is pushing three hours. But the thing is with Django and, and, and bastards, I don't feel the length when I'm just like locked in watching a movie, like because I'm enjoying everything that's happening with once upon a time in Hollywood. Although I enjoy aspects of what I'm watching, like the beautiful cinematography, the re reconstructed Hollywood. I just felt, I felt bored. I felt kind of bored, even though there's things that I love in it. And so it's the first Quentin movie where I was just kind of bored. And even rewatching it, although I do love a lot that's in it, it's not a bad film. It's just kind of boring. And so that's why I have to pick it as his worst film because, you know, even even like a film like like Hateful Eight, which is not his best film, I'm I was engaged the whole time watching it and even rewatching it, I'm still engaged because that dialogue just it pulled me in. So yeah, once once upon a time in Hollywood is, is my pick for for his worst film. But he doesn't have a bad film. Let's be honest. <laughs> like, well, with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood too, like you're talking about the way they it was very well known around here that the way he was they redressed up Hollywood to make it look like it did in the 60s. Obviously, Quentin Tarantino, this was kind of his, like his love letter to that era of Hollywood. Yeah. But but the problem is, is that I remember the first time I watched the movie, it's like, I want to go back and watch this movie again and time on my watch, how much time is spent with exterior driving shots. Exactly. It's like, look, I mean, I get it. You put a lot of work into it, but I felt like a lot of time was just driving exterior driving shots. Look how we transformed this thing. And with Sharon Tate, like there's a, there's a really big sequence in this movie where she goes to the Westwood Theater and she goes in, she sees her own film. She's got her bare feet up because Tarantino loves feet. She's got her bare feet up and all that kind of stuff. And like you realize, like even if you take into account what you were pointing out, like, you know, it's kind of setting us as the audience up for the big misdirect at the end. But that entire long ass sequence of her going to the movies, none of that was needed to be in there. It, right. it, none of it was necessary. Now, it is, it's not one of my favorite Quentin Tarantino movies, but man... 
The that last fact. 20 minutes of this film awesome. are so batshit crazy. And it's just oozing with awesomeness. Brad Pitt's Oscar winning performance. DiCaprio at his best. I still enjoyed this film. I did, even though for me, it's more of a middle of the pack Tarantino film. So Rob, let's, uh, you bring it home here. What is the worst Quentin Tarantino film? Well, you know, John, you and I are simpatico on this one. Oh, and, really? And yeah, I, I mean, I have to say that, you know, look, I understand that when they were doing it with Grindhouse, because you can't forget that 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 Death Proof was an experiment. Yeah. And I, I kind of see Death Proof as half a movie. I think if Quentin Tarantino was actually making Death Proof on its own outside of the Grindhouse double feature, it would have had more. There would have been more meat on its bones. Yeah, I think I, you're I, right. I, I, uh, I just kind of thought it was inconsequential. It's almost like a one joke movie. You've got stuntman Mike and he wants to create this peril. And I appreciate that he's such a fan of, there's all these movies in the seventies, like Vanishing Point and Two Lane Blacktop and Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, these sort of existential driving across the American Midwest or Southwest or something. And there was kind of an element of that. And then there was this car chase thing. But other than that, it doesn't really mean much. You know, like like you can you can watch Quentin Tarantino's films all have sort of an existential quality to them, whether it's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or Reservoir Dogs or something. There are these situations are Kill Bill one and two, which which were <laughs> close. Tarantino does love his feet. There you go. <laughs> um, I, I just felt that 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 death proof felt literally unfinished to me or mm, half half, half of a, half of a, baked, a yeah. movie i and I, I i didn't feel any existential it wasn't saying anything to me and all of his movies have something to say like yeah. it, and, and many different things they say many different things i mean you know when you get to the end of kill bill for instance kill bill 2 you expect this giant conflagration like a battle in the house of blue leaves that ends Kill Bill One, but you don't get that. You get this conversation where where David Carradine's talking about Superman and Clark Kent, and it's it's not what you expect. And and I love that about his movies. But with Death Proof, it was exactly what you expected. Mm. There was nothing about it that was surprising to me or that I could I could dig into. And I feel in that in that regard, I know he doesn't really regard the movie that. He doesn't think it's one of his best films either, but it just feels half-baked and unfinished to me. Tell me if you agree with this statement, because I remember I think the first time I saw it, I think I said this, it felt like a short film concept that got dragged into a feature film length. Yes. And, Ooh, and then yeah. and then it was removed from, you know, they never released Grindhouse as the full Grindhouse experience because you you got the trailers you got uh, planet terror and then you got i saw it, i saw it as the one big collection yeah it, but i mean it was released originally that way right, yeah, in yeah. theaters but then you got the movie separately planet terror became a robert rodriguez movie and death proof became a quentin tarantino movie and i think if you ask people today they forget when it was released theatrically you got this whole experience with the two movies and the fake trailers like uh don't Oh you know, my God, Don was so good. Thanksgiving. And, obviously, and Machete, obviously. Yeah, Machete. yeah, and, and that got turned into a movie too. But but the, I, and, and I just wonder, I've always wondered, because I've never seen the, the Grindhouse experience again, if I would like it more. Because I've watched Death Proof on its own outside of that experience, and I think it even works less than it did as part of this other thing. Because when it's on its own, it's it feels like it's missing something. Speaking of missing something, we have been sitting here talking about Quentin Tarantino movies. I mean, we've brought up, uh, obviously, Reservoir Dogs is one that we kind of, you just brought up, thankfully, one of one of us finally brought up Kill Bill. Oh. Because, yeah. or none of us have talked about Jackie Brown. No. Uh, Pulp Fiction. We didn't really talk about that. We talked a little bit about it, but. Yeah, I mean, it's just like the dude, and he says he's got one film left. I don't believe I don't him. Believe it. No, I don't believe it either. I think he means it. Like, I think he believes his next film is going to be his final film. But then it's like when he said, I'm not going to do Hateful Eight now. Once he has a little bit more time to think about it, after he, after he's done his 10th film, he'll think about it. And then some idea will hit his genius brain, you know, two years later. And then he'll just be compelled to do one more. But whatever. So, guys, there you have it. We have two votes for Death Proof. 
Uh, one for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is the worst. We had two for Inglorious Bastards is the best, and myself for Django Unchained is the best. What about you guys? When you think about the incredible filmography of Quentin Tarantino, what to you stands out as the best and what stands out to you as the worst or, in Cody's case, least favorite? Uh, whatever your thoughts are, jump into the comment section below and leave those thoughts there. I want to thank the guys in the room with me. First of all, well, sort of virtually in the room with us, Cody Miller, ladies and gentlemen. Cody, where can people follow you and your adventures online? Yeah, thanks. This was fun, guys. You can follow me on Instagram, just at Cody Miller, or on my YouTube channel, Cody Miller Adventures. Thanks, guys. And, of course, over here, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, where can people follow you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM, or find me at PostGeekSingularity.com or PostGeekSingularity on YouTube. And, of course, you guys can follow me on Instagram or on Twitter, simply at John Campia. Okay, guys, that'll do it for us for now. Make sure you come back again next week and join us for the next installment of Best Movie, Worst Movie. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.